Well, it's good to see you here this evening and a very warm welcome to each and every one as we gather for our evening service and especially those who are joining with us online. We do welcome you as uh, you share in our service of worship. We're going to be thinking tonight about someone who was very wealthy and uh, yet Christ challenged him about that wealth. And there's a verse in 1 Timothy chapter 6 where it says, Godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into the world, and we can take nothing out of it. But if we have food and clothing, we will be content with that. People who want to get rich fall into temptation and a trap. And so tonight we come to our opening hymn, which is, Be Thou My Vision, O Lord of My Heart. That sense of lifting our eyes above the things of this world, and of making the Lord our treasure, and of worshipping Him. So let's stand, and let's sing these words of praise. get us uh, a start in our service. Let's come now to God in our prayers. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we do give thanks tonight for that verse which says, Riches I heed not, nor man's empty praise. Thou mine inheritance, now and always. Thou and thou only, first in my heart, high King of heaven, 
my treasure thou art. And Father, as we come to you this evening, we are conscious, Lord, that for any of us, our treasure might be first in our heart in terms of our bank balance or our properties or our lands or whatever, Lord God, our, our cars and our possessions. We're conscious, Lord, of how these things, the riches of life, can be a snare to us. They can catch us and they can lead to idolatry in our lives. And Father, they can tear us down and keep us from you and make us slaves. And Father, ultimately, they can destroy our souls. And yet, Father, this hymn has reminded us this evening of how you are our true treasure, how the Lord Jesus Christ is our wisdom, our righteousness, our holiness, our redemption, that he is our true wealth, our true health, our true prosperity. And in him and in him alone do we find spiritual treasure, do we find that treasure which lasts, which doesn't rust or doesn't decay or get eaten away by inflation. But we thank you that in Christ there is a permanent treasure and that he is your treasure, your gift to the world. Help us, Lord, we pray, not to boast of our earthly wealth, but help us to boast in him, in Christ, and who he is and in what he has done. Help us to sing with the hymn writer, I'd rather have Jesus than silver or gold. I'd rather be his than have riches untold. I'd rather have Jesus than houses or lands. I'd rather be led by his nail-pierced hand. Father, we pray tonight that you'll speak to us through your word on these themes. Challenge us, Lord God, about our relationship with money, with mammon, with wealth. And help us, we pray, Father, to be to be spoken to tonight in the power of the Spirit as we just consider your word now together. For we pray and ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, let's read together from, again, Matthew's Gospel and Matthew chapter 19. Matthew chapter 19. And uh, we're going to read from verse 16 down to verse 30 at the end of the chapter. So Matthew chapter 19, and beginning to read at verse 16, this is the word of God. Now a man came up to Jesus and asked, Teacher, what good thing must I do to get eternal life? Why do you ask me about what is good? Jesus replied, there is only one who is good. If you want to enter life, obey the commandments. Which ones? The man inquired. Jesus replied, do not murder, do not commit adultery, do not steal, do not give false testimony, honor your father and mother, and love your neighbor as yourself. All these I've kept, the young man said, what do I still lack? Jesus answered, if you want to be perfect, go sell your possessions and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven, then come follow me. When the young man heard this, he went away sad because he had great wealth. Then Jesus said to his disciples, I tell you the truth, it is hard for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. Again, I tell you, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. When the disciples heard this, they were greatly astonished and asked, who then can be saved? Jesus looked at them and said, With man this is impossible, but with God all things are possible. Peter answered him, We have left everything to follow you. What then will there be for us? Jesus said to them, I tell you the truth, at the renewal of all things, when the Son of Man sits on his glorious throne, you who have followed me will also sit on twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. And everyone who has left houses or brothers or sisters or father or mother or children or fields for my sake will receive a hundred times as much and will inherit eternal life. But many who are first will be last and many who are last will be first. Amen. And we thank God for tonight the reading of his word. 
Well, it's great to see some boys and girls here this evening. Not many, but there are some. And it's really good to see you. And uh, I'm going to speak to you now. And we're going to think about a tower this evening up to heaven. I'm sure you've all built a tower at some stage, maybe with Lego. Yep, good, Caleb. You've built a tower. Um, good. You too, Abigail. Yep. We know what it's like to build a tower, and I'm going to think about some towers this evening. Here's the first one coming up on the screen. Does anybody know the name of that tower? What country it might be from? Abigail. Pardon? The Eiffel Tower. That's right. Do you know what country it's in? Caleb? France? Okay. Um, and it's a very tall tower. And uh, if you were there, you'd be able to see just how high it is pointing up into the sky. Here's the next one. Anybody know that one? It's at a funny angle, isn't it? It's kind of, it's like falling over. Anybody know the name of that one? It's, the, it's called the Leaning Tower of, the Leaning Tower of, 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 of Isaac. Pisa, good boy. The Leaning Tower of Pisa, and that one's in Italy. Okay. And here's the third one. A bit harder to see that one. Um, anybody want to say where that one might be? Or what does that one remind you of? If it had a point on it, let's say it had a big point, and it was in Egypt, you might say it was not quite a tower, but Isaac? A pyramid, yep. Okay, and this is, this is a pyramid, but you can see this one's got a ramp up the front, or steps maybe up the front of it. You can call, some people call these ziggurats, okay? Um, and it's a different type of a pyramid. And uh, one of these may well be in the Bible, in the book of Genesis, in chapter 11. Because back in those days, all the people of the world spoke only one language. Imagine that. In all the world, just one language, you could understand everybody. You didn't need to learn Spanish or Japanese or Arabic or any of those other languages. We all speak English, but um, there are many other languages in the world you can learn. But in those days, when people said hello to you, you knew what they were saying. When they said, how are you doing? You could answer them and tell them how you were doing. Everybody knew exactly what you went and meant and what you were saying. Nobody went, huh? What? I don't understand you. You speak a different language. Because in those days, everybody built, everybody spoke the same language. So what they decided to do was they would come together and they would build a tower. Um, and they began to build this tower. It'll be our home, they said. We'll be safe in it forever. And we're going to build it up to heaven. And they began to build brick by brick. They got the scaffolding out just like next door. For us here, the, the uh, new building is going up. Um, maybe sort of cranes to lift up the blocks and so on to get them up higher and higher and higher. And uh, this tower, a giant tower, went up until the day when it was finished. And the people were so proud. They thought, we are so clever. And they shouted, hurrah! We're the smart ones. We're famous. When we come together and we work together, we can do really good things. They were really pleased with themselves. They thought they were God's because they were trying to build up into heaven. But the Bible says God wasn't pleased. God could see exactly what they were doing. They were trying to find life without God. And that wouldn't make them safe or happy or live forever. They'd only end up ruining themselves. So God came down. And God mixed up their languages. And that was his punishment for what they were doing. He mixed up their languages. So the next morning when they went out and they said to somebody, hello there, how are you? The person went, has he just said I've got a big nose? Because they couldn't work out what people were saying. Or somebody else, you might have said, that's a lovely dress you're wearing. And they went, did they just say I'm a really boring person? And fights broke out amongst them. And they began to get really angry with one another. They became grumpier and grumpier and grumpier. And the work stopped. And they began to spread out. All the people who spoke, let's say, German, all the people who spoke German went over there. And all the people, let's say, who spoke Spanish, they went over there. 
and all the people who spoke, let's say, uh, uh, Arabic, they all went over there. Everybody went up into their language groups. And that's why you see the world today. There's a picture of the world. There's just so many different languages. I think there's something like 4,000 languages in the world today. 4,000 languages. But you see, God was teaching the people, you can't get to heaven without me. You can't do it on your own. You can't climb up into heaven and build your big tower for yourself. I've got to come down, and I have got to come down to save you from being so silly and so, so, uh, such big fools. And that's why, here's our last slide this evening. Jesus said when he came, he said, go into all the world and make disciples of all nations. Go into all the world and make disciples of all nations. The last bit, ah, there it is. You see, Jesus is the one who brings people together again. Because of our sin, we were all pushed out and we didn't want to know each other. But Jesus is the one who brings us together again. And the church of Jesus Christ is found all over the world. And in him, we are brothers and sisters. We love, we get on together. We're different. We maybe speak different languages at times. But it speaks to people about the goodness of God, that he came to save us from, from being foolish. And he came to bring us to himself, that we might be a new family and be together again and speak one language of love. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for um, how you rescued the people from, from being fools through Jesus Christ. And we thank you for how they, they built that tower in the Old Testament, but you taught them a lesson that we can't go up to heaven and build big staircases into the sky, but you have to come down to us. And we thank you that you did in Jesus. Help us to believe in him and to know the family of God that meets around him. For we pray in his name. Amen. Okay, we're going to sing the children's hymn. Thank you for answering my questions and taking part in the children's talk. The hymn is, Give me oil in my lamp, keep me burning. Give me oil in my lamp, I pray.
Thanks to our musicians and singers for leading us tonight in our praise. Uh, it's good again to, to see you here at our evening service. And uh, just a few announcements at this point. Nothing really any different this morning. The prayer meeting here tomorrow night at 8. Wednesday the midweek here in the church at 8. Um, continuing on our series in the life of Peter as he encountered the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, next Sunday I hope to be speaking in the morning. And Richard... Morrison in the evening and uh, Sunday school did get up back and running this morning there's about 50 uh, young people children and young people there this morning that was really encouraging um, after the long uh, break about two-thirds maybe what we would normally have but do uh, encourage anyone you know um, maybe not back at Sunday school yet and uh, the teachers were really encouraged this morning to see the children there and uh, so glad to be back and the teachers were so glad to see them as well so that was really really encouraging and Sunday school next week again is at 12 until 12 45. I want to tonight um, you probably gathered in the news our country is uh, 100 years old and I want tonight just to lead you in a prayer really of thanksgiving for our country um, and for the, the the place where we live and I hope this is uh, a helpful prayer just as we uh, give thanks to God for uh, where we find ourselves. So let's, let's pray tonight. Our Father in heaven, as we pray to you this evening, we do thank you for the country that we live in. Um, this country that we have been hearing is just about 100 years old. We thank you, Lord, for the natural beauty, for the beaches, for the mountains, for the rivers, for the rolling hills. We thank you for the forests and the forest walks, for the lakes, for the farmland, for the temperate climate. And we thank you, Heavenly Father, that we do live in a beautiful country. And we give thanks, Father, for the many ways in which that beauty is manifested. We thank you also for the people of this country, Lord, and warm and generous in so many ways. We thank you for the emergency services, for the health service, for the schools, for the jobs. And in a world of much poverty, we are a rich people. And especially spiritually, Lord, we know that we are among the super rich of this world. We thank you for the evangelical history of our country, indeed of this whole island the churches, the gospel preaching, the Bibles, the prayer meetings, the children's work, the revivals, the good deeds in remembering the poor and relieving suffering wherever it is found. Help us, we pray, Lord, to value our heritage, to appreciate it, and, Father, to uh, use the means of grace and to do whatever we can in order to further the kingdom of God. For we know, Lord, that whatever material wealth we may have, material wealth only facilitates physical health. Real wealth is spiritual, treasure in heaven, knowing Christ as Lord and Savior. Father, hear our prayer of thanksgiving tonight. Many other things we could mention. Forgive us our sins. And as we turn in a moment or two to your word, to this passage in Matthew's gospel. Father, we pray that you will open our eyes that we might see wonderful things in your word. Father, hear us as we bring our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, let's stand and sing one more before we come to Matthew chapter 19. It's the hymn, The Splendor of the King, and it's going to run into How Great Thou Art. Yeah, okay. Tremble, 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 Tremble,
Whenever we read our Bibles, one of the things we find about the Lord Jesus Christ is that during his earthly ministry, people came to him for different reasons. Lepers, for example, had an illness that was slowly but surely destroying them. And they came to Jesus to be healed, believing that he would cleanse them. Nicodemus came to Jesus under cover of darkness. He had religious questions. He was confused, and he believed that Jesus could bring him the answers. The woman with the issue of blood was slowly bleeding to death. She came to touch the hem of Christ's garment, believing that he could stem the flow of blood and give her life. The woman at the well had a guilty conscience. She had had five husbands, was living with her sixth, and she believed that Jesus was the Messiah, and she found forgiveness in him and an easy conscience and salvation for her soul. We could give many examples of people who came to Jesus, who were drawn to him, and who found that he more than matched their need. But the one we're thinking about tonight is here in Matthew chapter 19, the one we read earlier in the service. Verse 16 says, Now a man came up to Jesus and asked, Teacher, what good thing must I do to get eternal life? And verse 22 tells us this was a young man. Now it's good when we're young, as Ecclesiastes says, to remember your creator in the days of your youth. As you get older, the cares of this world can crowd out uh, any thoughts of God and squeeze your life in such a way that really God gets pushed out onto the peripheries. As you age, your hearing goes. You can no longer hear the word of God. Your sight goes. You can no longer read the word of God. Your mind can go with something like dementia and you can no longer understand the ways of God. It's good to remember your creator in the days of your youth before it's too late, in other words, and you've missed the boat. And that's the theme of Ecclesiastes chapter 12. And so this young man is asking the question, teacher, what good thing must I do to get eternal life? And the very fact he's asking the question and he's framing it in that way shows that he didn't have eternal life. And he's anxious about his lack of eternal life. And he wants to know how he might lay hold of it. And it's hopeful, isn't it, that he's asking such a question. He desires salvation. But just because you're asking questions that are spiritual questions, it doesn't mean really anything at all. But at least it's hopeful that he's asking, what must I do to get eternal life? Notice Jesus' answer, verse 17. Why do you ask me about what is good? There is only one who is good. If you want to enter life, obey the commandments. The man had asked, what good thing must I do to get eternal life? But Jesus directed him to the only one who is good. Now, we live in a world where the basic belief is that people may do bad things from time to time, but that we are essentially, basically at heart, every one of us, good people. But that's not the gospel according to Jesus Christ. The gospel according to Jesus Christ is that there is only one who is good here in verse 17. No one is good except God alone, is the fuller version in Luke chapter 18. And that's a hammer blow to human pride and to human self-satisfaction. You think of a scale, for example, of 1 to 10. You know those things you have to mark, um, maybe on a paper, from, from 1 to 10. 1 is the least goodness and, and 10 is the most goodness. Put yourself on the scale. Where would you put yourself? Well, if you're a modest being, you might say, I'll go 3 or 4. If you're a proud person, you might go eight or nine. According to Jesus Christ, on the scale of goodness, we all score zero. Every last one of us. As Psalm 14 puts it, there is no one good, not even one. And that's why Christ says to this young man, 
If you want to enter life, obey the commandments. Do not murder. Do not commit adultery. Do not steal. Do not give false testimony. Honor your father and mother and love your neighbor as yourself. Sadly, in the modern world, the Ten Commandments are ridiculed and rejected. Tragically, in the modern church, the Ten Commandments are ridiculed and rejected with people who should know better saying things like, oh, we're not under law, we're under grace. But here's Jesus Christ quoting the Ten Commandments. The Ten Commandments are still in place as far as Jesus Christ is concerned. It used to be the practice in some churches, and I've been in churches like this in England, uh, in old Church of England churches up behind the minister, um, on the wall, on the front gable wall, painted on the plaster were the Ten Commandments, the first table of the law on one side and the second table of the law on the other, before the people Sunday by Sunday. No PowerPoint in those days, of course, so you just painted it onto the wall. The Ten Commandments. You know, if I said, uh, I think we should do that in Drumray, words would go out, Murray's a legalist. Isn't that right? That's what people would be saying, Murray's a legalist. Putting the Ten Commandments up on the wall of the church. But here's Christ, quoting the Ten Commandments to this young man and saying to him, do not murder, do not commit adultery, do not steal, do not give false testimony, honor your father and mother and love your neighbor as yourself. Why did Jesus do that? Why did he quote the Ten Commandments? Why did Jesus show that these are not outdated, these are not irrelevant, these are not consigned to the museum? Because what Jesus is doing here, he's not giving this young man an exercise in box ticking for this young man to kind of, you know, polish his fingernails and say, I tick every box, I'm good, I'm a nice person. What Jesus here is doing is showing that this young man is full of pride. He thinks he's kept every one of them. Has he never examined his thoughts? The Bible says, do not commit adultery. It doesn't mean, you know, that only getting into bed with someone is adultery. It means, do you think about it? Same thing. Or, or do not uh, give false testimony. How many times have we said things about people that are uncorroborated? We can't stand over them, but we say them anyway. Jesus here is, is, is trying to, uh, to show this young man that he is not. His life is not as respectable as he thinks it is. He may have uh, outwardly a respectable life. He may have much money and be well off and be quite self-satisfied. But the one thing he doesn't have in his life is a sense of sin. No sense of need. No sense of his heart being rotten. No sense of, of, being, of having a heart that is desperately wicked, as the prophet Jeremiah said about the human heart. This young man is self-satisfied. This young man is self-content. He doesn't really need God, although he does have a wee niggle about whether he has got eternal life or not. And that's why in verse 20 he says to Jesus, all these I have kept. Since my youth, what do I still lack? Sometimes when you go to GB or BB displays, they do an item using ultraviolet light. And if you've been in one of those uh, displays, all the other lights are switched off and only the ultraviolet light is switched on. And the girls or the boys are maybe wearing white gloves or something like that and they're marching and the, the arms are swinging and you see that it brings the whiteness out. Um, of the gloves and they stand out so much more vividly but the funny thing is so does the fluff on your clothes and you're maybe wearing a suit or you've got something nice blouse on ladies or whatever it might be and the ultraviolet light it shows up the fluff or maybe the dandruff and it was there all the time 
It just wasn't visible. And Jesus quoting the Ten Commandments to this young man, he is showing up not the fluff in his life, he is showing up the blindness of his life, the sin of his life. He thinks he's okay. All these I've kept. He's looked at the Ten Commandments. He's ticked every one of them. He's working his way into God's good books. He thinks he ticks all the boxes, and he's complimenting himself even on what a decent, respectable, honest young man he is. He has no sense of sin whatsoever that he is not right with God. So the question that he has come to ask Jesus what do I still lack? For him, really, he's asking, he's just not sure. There's a wee niggle. Respectability has covered over his sin and has taken away any sense of sin that he has. It's like whitewashing a fence where the wood is rotten. The fence will look good for a while, but the whitewash hasn't addressed the real problem. This young man's real problem is that he's never admitted he's a sinner who needs to be saved. So what did he need? Well, Jesus answered, verse 21, If you want to be perfect, go sell your possessions and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come and follow me. Now, what strikes me here is the different answer Jesus gave to the question that uh, was being asked, a different answer to a question, to the question that, that you or I might give. Someone was to say to you or me, what must I do to be saved? Would be saying, here's journey into life. Maybe you read that wee booklet. Or, or would say to them, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, then you'll be saved. You and your household, or join our church and become one of us. What good thing must I do to get eternal life? Look what Jesus said. If you want to be perfect, go sell your possessions and give to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come and follow me. Now, obviously, we're not Jesus. We, we can't speak with that authority to people. But what Jesus is doing there is Jesus is showing this young man. He may be professing that he loves his neighbor as himself. Well, Jesus says, okay, sell your possessions and give it to your poor neighbor. And the young man goes away, says verse 22, sad, because he had great wealth. So often, isn't it the case that when Christ is preached, then it comes across that Jesus is some sort of spiritual vending machine. You come to Jesus and he always makes you happy. He always makes you joyful. He always makes you content and, and so on and full of peace. Here's a young man who comes to Jesus and he goes away sad. And we never hear from him again, as far as we know. Goes away sad. Because why? He had great wealth. His wealth was, was, was blocking his soul, if you like. His wealth was, was shielding him. It had built a big wall around him. And he had no sense of need, no sense of, of, of hungering or thirsting for righteousness. His respectability and his wealth had cushioned him from seeking God. And Jesus puts his finger on it by saying to him, go and sell your possessions and give to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven. He had broken actually the first commandment. You shall have no other God before me. Because his wealth was his God. And he wasn't prepared to reorder his priorities in order to follow Jesus Christ. Does this mean that believers can't have houses or cars or bank accounts? No, because people like Abraham and Job and Lydia were all believers and had wealth of various degrees. But what Jesus is doing here is that Jesus is saying that if you want to be saved, if you want to get eternal life, he has to come first. And if he tells you to give up all, then you give up all. 
He maybe doesn't desire that of, of, of many of us, but if he does desire it, then if that's what you want, Lord, that's, that's what you get. That we make everything in our lives available to Christ. We just throw it down and say, Lord, it's yours. I'm yours. Take it. Whatever you want. You're the Lord. The just shall live by faith was how Habakkuk summarized it. And this radical change of priorities, turning around from wealth, turning around from respectability, is what Christ expects. Life change. It's just not praying a wee prayer and asking the Lord Jesus into your life. It's changing your life completely around and reordering all your priorities. So let me finish with three observations, three practical applications. Beware the dangers of wealth, first thing. Jesus says in verse 23, as the young man goes away, Jesus says, I tell you the truth, it is hard for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. And then he talks about a camel going through the eye of a needle. Think of a, a, a darning needle or sewing needle. Imagine a camel, you have to cut it up into tiny slices and and feed it through the eye. It can be bad enough feeding a thread through the eye of a needle. How are you ever going to feed a camel through the eye of a needle? It's not impossible, but it's almost impossible. And just so with riches, they, they make us comfortable. They insulate us from spiritual urgency. We think we've made it. We can even say, God has blessed us. Not realizing that our wealth is stopping us feel acutely our need of being saved and our need of serving the Lord, whatever he asks of us. As I said this morning, and the title of the sermon is, you can be asset rich, but spiritually poor. Asset rich, but spiritually poor. Secondly, we learn from this passage that salvation is not something we earn. It's the gift of God that comes down to us from heaven. Jesus says about salvation in verse 26, with man, this is impossible, but with God, all things are possible. As he said to the children, we try to build our way up to heaven, but salvation is God coming down to us. To be saved, we have to look to God for salvation. Nothing in my hand I bring, simply to thy cross I cling. The question is, how much do you want to be saved? The young man didn't really want to be saved. He was asking the spiritual question, what good thing must I do to get eternal life? But when the answer was given, he wanted his wealth more than he wanted Christ. And thirdly, if we do reorder our priorities, if we do follow Jesus, whatever challenge he gives to us, then anything we lose out on earth Anything we have to give up, houses, brothers, sisters, father, mother, children, fields, in order to follow Jesus by faith, says verse 29, we will be repaid a hundred times as much and will inherit eternal life. Interest rates in bank accounts at the minute are what? If you're in a savings account, they're about 1% at a push. Don't think they even are that. Here is Jesus offering interest of 100%. Anything you or I has to give up, anything you or I has to surrender, we will receive 100 times as much and will inherit eternal life. No sacrifice any of us ever make for Jesus goes unnoticed or unrecorded. Remember Peter on Wednesday night past, he lent Jesus his boat and Jesus filled the boat with fish. He is the king on the throne and his people are observed by him and his people matter to him and any sacrifice you or I make for Jesus, it's worth it. Absolutely, 100% worth it. So as I close, what is first in your heart? What's first in my heart? Some people are living for their inheritance. Some people are fighting for their inheritance. Some people are 
are grieving perhaps it's not the inheritance they expected jesus here speaks about the inheritance of eternal life treasure in heaven not treasure on earth it's dead easy to live for treasure on earth but living for treasure in heaven takes us to a whole new level but how much do you want it do you want it enough to surrender all to christ or do you say that's a bit high isn't it ricky surrender all to christ if you don't surrender all you can't have eternal life salvation is surrendering your all if you don't surrender all you'll go away sad from jesus christ but if you do surrender all you'll know the joy of jesus christ we sometimes sing that hymn i surrender all i surrender all the sentiments are true sentiments to be saved it is about surrendering all and following christ and discovering the joy that he alone brings is the wealth of our souls as our treasure in heaven let's pray father we thank you for your word and we thank you for this encounter between this rich young ruler this young man who had a position in society who was wealthy who was respectable and yet there was something niggling at his soul that he wasn't right with you and we thank you for how jesus identified that his wealth was his god that he was serving mammon not god and we thank you for how jesus brought that out and for how he showed him the need to surrender all father we know that it's still the same today that salvation is about surrendering all following jesus whatever the cost living for him and for him alone and then inheriting eternal life father we thank you that he is no fool who gives what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose help us lord god we pray to live for the kingdom of heaven not for the kingdoms of this world and to know lord god one day the reward of eternal life for we pray in jesus name amen let's sing our closing hymn then this evening it's out of my bondage um, sorrow and night jesus i come jesus i come and wealth can be a bondage on our souls but we come out of those things to the freedom that Jesus Christ gives.
grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the fellowship of the Spirit be our portion this day and forevermore. Amen.